We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. We're gonna make it look fly with some DIY. Uh oh, thrift diving. Hey, what's up? It's Serena Pia from thriftdiving.com, which is a podcast, a blog, and a YouTube channel that helps you decorate, improve, and maintain your home with paint, power tools, and thrift stores without sacrificing your budget, the environment, or style. Welcome to episode 44 of the Thrift Diving Podcast. We are quickly making our way to episode 50, and I'm so thankful every week you show up here like clockwork (laughs) and you listen to what I have to say, and hopefully we're having a conversation in your mind back and forth. Because unfortunately, I'm talking to myself right now, but I like knowing that you're going to be listening later when I publish this. But today we are going to be talking about understanding wood finishes. And I just started thinking about a project that I did, I guess it was four years ago. I built this bathroom vanity from scratch and I started doing a lot of digging and testing and trying to figure out what would be the the perfect finish for this vanity that I just spent, gosh, two months building. So I want you to think for just a moment, imagine that you spent a weekend or even months building a project and stripping it or maybe sanding a piece of furniture down to the bare wood because you want to put some new stain on it, but then you just ruin it with the finish. Like, can you imagine how devastating that's got to feel? That was my fear. Four years ago when I built this solid oak vanity, it's a 60 inch vanity, and I'll leave a link down below in the description where you can see all the steps that I, that I did to finish and to even build this vanity. But imagine that you spend all this time making something and it doesn't have to be big. It could be just something that fits in your lap. It doesn't have to be big and expensive, but you're proud of it. And just imagine getting to that point where you want to create a finish for it and you have an idea in your mind what it's going to look like and then you ruin it. Like that is the worst. I can't even imagine. That was my fear back then. My fear also (laughs) started cropping up when I was doing my closet makeover. I was building that. Remember I was talking about that recently over the summer? So I wanted to talk a little bit about the things that I have learned about finishing wood and just lessons learned. Things that might help you as you're going along in your DIY journey. And whether you're building something, whether you're stripping it and refinishing it, I wanted to talk about those lessons. And hopefully there's something that you learned from this that you didn't know. All right. So, okay, let me tell you a little bit about this vanity (laughs) and why this was such a pivotal, that's the word I'm looking for, why this was such a pivotal project for me, right? Because I'd never built anything of this size before. Like I said, historically, I've been painting furniture. I've stripped some things down. Sometimes I would leave it natural. Sometimes I would add a stain to it. But I'd never up until that point built something so large. And this thing, as I mentioned, it took me two months to build. You know, there's a really great program called SketchUp. And I'm I'm pretty sure that I've talked about it before. It's this modeling program. You can get it for free. They've got a paid version. And if you know how to use SketchUp, it's great because when you're building something, You can model it up in SketchUp. It'll tell you the measurements. And when you're ready to cut all your pieces out, if you modeled it up properly, it should turn out. (laughs) Now I say should, it doesn't always happen that way. Mistakes do happen, user error. But I didn't have SketchUp back then. It was literally just a piece of paper, a pencil, and me sketching what I'm going to be building. So it took me two months to build because I didn't know what fit where And I was afraid I was going to make a mistake. So when it was all done, it was this beautiful piece of red oak. And in my mind, I had this idea that I was going to do this ceruced oak look. Now, you may not have heard ceruced oak before, because when I was researching it, I'd never heard that term before. But you've seen the look. And it's basically when you've got this beautiful oak. And instead of the oak being stained with let's say, I don't know, a dark stain where you can see the look of the grain and it's like a black grain. It has a white grain instead. And it's just a beautiful finish. And when I started thinking that I wanted to build a vanity, I said, that's the look I want. I want this ceruced oak look, but I could not figure out how to achieve it. Everywhere that I looked, I couldn't find good instructions 
anywhere to achieve the look that I was looking for. So I had to do a lot of research before I jumped into my project. So even though I was done the vanity, it was sitting there, I had to, well, I actually, I think I, it's been so long ago, I don't remember if I bought extra wood or if I went and bought some extra wood just to practice. But I remember going through test board after test board, trying to see what's the product that I need and what's the order that I layer these materials in order to get the look I'm looking for. And it took a while. And that's actually lesson number one is your project time should take just as long as your finishing time. And this is true if you're building a project or if you're stripping it and you know, maybe it's a secondhand piece of furniture, don't skimp on the finishing. Once you're done building or stripping, you have to take just as much time to figure out how to finish it because the last thing you want to do is build this amazing project. Again, could be small, could be large, could be secondhand, could be built, you know, from scratch. But the last thing you want to do is to <laughs> ruin the project. So don't feel like you have to rush through the project to get it completed. Make sure you're spending that time finishing it just as much as you spent building it or stripping it. Okay, the next lesson that I learned is that there is a difference between wood dyes and wood pigments. And I'll be honest with you, I didn't even know before that vanity project that there was ever even a thing as wood dyes. <laughs> because I remember, I never had really worked with wood other than just painting it. So I assumed that Minwax and Varathane, those were like the end all be all to wood finishing. It's whatever you find on the shelves when you go to Home Depot and Lowe's. I really thought that that's pretty much all there was. But there are these things called wood dyes, and they're great because wood dyes are different in that they actually soak into the wood, and they're water-based, but they allow you to change the color a little bit. So let's say you want the color to be a little deeper, or maybe you did one wood dye and now you want to mix your own and put another layer of a different wood dye. You can kind of create custom looks with wood dyes and you can't really do that with a wood pigment. So once you put that pigment, like let's say the Minwax or the Varathanes on your wood, that's pretty much it. They have pigments that just sit on top of the wood and there's not much that you can do other than, you know, just maybe add another coat. You might be able to darken it up because more pigment would be on there. But the wood dyes actually penetrate the wood and the color of the wood itself. Now, because it does that, it's more susceptible to fading. And so it's, it's not something that you would want to sit in direct sunlight. So just be mindful if you're, you know, if you're doing a project and it's going to have the sun, the afternoon sun beaming down, it's probably going to fade your project. Then you would want to use pigments. But if you want your wood to have maybe a custom color, uh, you can take these powdered uh, dyes and actually mix them with some liquid and create your own colors. And that's what I did when I did the vanity. I actually had used, I think the the name of it is called Transfast. And I ordered maybe several of them. They, they have turquoise blue, ebony, gray, java. They have all these colors. And of course, I ordered them each. <laughs> I'll leave a link down below and where you can find them, but they're very flexible. They're water-based and I'm not sure how long the dye lasts for. I think I just mixed in some water, put it in a container and then just left it for a while and you can continue to use it for probably six months or so. But the one thing I like, if the dye is too dark, you can actually just wipe on some water. It'll start to become lighter. <laughs> you can't do that with Minwax and Varathane. Those pigments don't allow you to do that, but the wood dyes, you can do that. So it's just really easy to work with. And I wanted that flexibility when working with the vanity because I didn't want to put some color on there and then say, oh, this is too light or too dark and then not be able to do anything with it. So if you're interested in wood dyes, I would say buy some, try them on different pieces of scrap wood just to see how you like them and to see how different wood takes, you know, takes the color of the dye. I think they're about maybe $12.50. I think I paid about $12.50 each from the woodworking store. You can get them on Amazon. I will leave links down below. But the ones that I bought are called Homestead Trans Fast Water Soluble Wood Dye Stains. <laughs> That's a mouthful, isn't it? You really only have to mix just a teeny bit of the powder with the water to get a nice deep color. So the next lesson, lesson three, is that there are big differences between polyurethane, varnish, shellac, and lacquer. And I'll be honest, I don't really consider myself to be a finishing professional. 
I generally find a couple of products that I like and I stick to them. Like for example, I love General Finishes high performance top coat. I tend to use the satin finish because it looks great. I've used it for many projects and it just feels really good and you don't see a lot of brush strokes in the finish. And I sand in between the coats and I usually will do probably two or three coats and it feels wonderful on the wood. Like for example, I used that when I did my walk-in closet. It turned out great. I, I left the maple plywood natural. I didn't put anything on it except for the general finishes, high performance top coat, and it looked great. Three coats. But generally there's a difference between shellac, polyurethane, varnish, and lacquer. So for example, shellac is something that's very natural. I know a lot of woodworkers love to use it. It can come in a solid form, but it can also come in flakes. So some woodworkers like to mix their own with alcohol and it has like this amber color. I generally don't like that amber color. I like to get away from the amber color because it looks, to me, it looks very outdated. I don't like it. Anything that turns my wood kind of yellow orange, eh, it just, it just does something to me. <laughs> It just makes me want to run away. I don't like that kind of wood. But shellac, you know, generally woodworkers love shellac. And I think it depends on the type of wood that you're putting it on, the color of the wood. So again, you just have to test out a few boards and see what do you like better. But with shellac, I will say that if you are finishing something that is going to be affected by hot temperatures, like let's say a dining room table, a coffee table, you know, you're putting cups of tea on the coffee table, you might not want to use shellac, okay? Polyurethane is kind of the same way in that if you are putting things that have high temperatures, cold temperatures, you can start to mess up the finish. And so even though it's a liquid plastic and it can be very durable, you want to be sure that you're not using it for anything that's going to get these extreme temperatures. And it does come in water-based or oil-based for the polyurethane. Now, remember last week or the week before in episode, I think it was 43 or 42, I was talking about polycrylic and some people love polycrylic. I think it turns white paint or light colored paint yellow, even though it's water-based. Oil-based will do that. Some people say, oh no, water-based doesn't do that. Polycrylic works great for me. But in my experience, it has turned things yellow. So I typically don't like to use it on lighter color paints or finishes or whatever. But varnish, now I guess the general finishes would be considered a varnish. That's kind of a generic name for a top coat. It is more solid. It's more durable. It does provide some UV protection. But one in particular that's kind of popular is spar varnish, S-P-A-R. When I built my vanity for the bathroom, I actually used spar varnish on it because I wanted to make sure that if there was any water that got on this wood, that it wouldn't damage the wood or the finish. So I did do a coat of spar varnish on the wood. And I think I may have done the inside drawers with a spar varnish as well. I'd have to look back at the blog post to see what I did. Sometimes I do projects and I forget what I did. <laughs> People will say, oh, well, what did you do? And I'm like, well, sh I don't know. That was like four years ago. But yeah, spar varnish is good for any kind of wood that's going to be near water. So for a vanity, yes, spar varnish, any water splashes, it's not going to damage the wood. But a lot of times people who are finishing boats, you'll see spar varnish being used. Decks, any sort of beach chairs, things that are going to be outdoors, it does have protective value. So you want to use that for anything that's around water. And lacquer needs to be sprayed on. But if you have ever used Amy Howard's spray varnish, it looks just like, you know, a varnish that you would have sprayed on with a paint sprayer. It looks really nice. It's beautiful. If you love that high glossy finish look, I would definitely recommend don't get, in fact, I think I told you this in episode 42, don't go to Home Depot or Lowe's and buy high gloss paint to paint your projects. Get the Amy Howard spray lacquer. That's going to that's gonna work much better for your projects. And then, of course, there's different oils you can put on your projects, too. I don't know a lot about them. I think times when I've used oils, I've run into problems. I mean, there's times when it's worked out well, and then there's times when I've used like like a tongue oil, not a true tongue oil, because tongue oil... When you're using that on wood, it can take a long time to dry. So a lot of times they'll put drying agents in the tongue oil so that it dries quickly. I have used tongue oil on, gosh, I think it was a mid-century modern dresser. 
And I finished the drawers with tongue oil and it was so beautiful. The wood popped. I think it was maybe, it might have been like a walnut, like a walnut veneer. It was just, it was gorgeous. There's other, you know, there's other oils that I've used that didn't dry quite so well. (laughs) So sometimes it's hit or miss with projects, but you know, I'm not going to spend this whole thing going over the differences because sometimes I still feel like I don't know as much as I would like to about the difference between the shellax and the polyurethanes. I mean, there's a lot of different brands out there, but I will leave a link to an article. There is a article that I found that really describes each of them and the differences and, you know, the times when you want to use them and you don't want to use them depending on your project, I'll leave that link down below. But just know that there is a difference and it really depends on how the project is being used. Okay, lesson number four, I learned that sanding sealer is your best friend. Until I started working on that vanity, I didn't even know that there was such a thing as sanding sealer. But it really has become my best friend because when I was finishing this vanity, I needed to create, without going through the entire project, I really needed to create a, a layer that sealed in the die, right? So there were like layers on top of layers of things that I did. And I'd have to go back and look, but I remember using the sanding sealer in between the die and the top coats. Because remember the die, if the color is too dark, all you have to do is apply a little bit of water. And what does it do? It lightens up the dye. So just imagine if you've got a finished piece of wood, you've got your wood dye, and then you're going over it with a water-based top coat. Well, what can that do? It can actually kind of mess up your dye because it's water-based. So it may start to lighten your dye. But a sanding sealer is like a really easy to sand middle coat to kind of keep everything, all your layers separate. It's a shellac. It's actually a wax-free shellac. And it's really great for, you know, keeping those layers separate, but you can still paint over it. You can still add top coat over it, but it has to be de-wax shellac. And of course, I will leave a link down below. But another thing I like about it too, remember in a recent episode, I told you about the old stain or the tannins that sort of infiltrate your paint, right? When you've got this bleed through. Well, a coat of the sanding sealer is actually a really good way to prevent bleeding through of your paint. (laughs) You prevent those tannins from bleeding through. So if you go to refinish a piece of furniture with paint and you're using a light color paint and you notice that, oh my gosh, I keep putting layer after layer, but it keeps turning orange or red. Well, you can put a coat of sanding sealer down over top of it and then paint it and it'll work beautifully. Now here's another tip too. And I forgot to mention this about shellac. Several years ago, I went to this woman and interviewed her. She's got this dip and strip place that if let's say you've got some dining room chairs and you don't want to sand them down, but you want her to dip them, she will dip them to strip them. (laughs) It sounds funny saying that, but it it is a dip and strip service that she provides. And there's a gentleman she works with that after the chairs and the furniture, whatever it is that they're stripping is stripped, he'll go through and do like a nice sanding down of the, the piece. Well, he also does painting of furniture. And so he says what he'll do before he paints a piece of furniture, he will actually use a coat of shellac over top of the wood and then paint the project. He said the reason why he does that is so that if someone wants to later on strip that paint off and then take it back down to the beautiful wood, it's easier to get the paint off if you've got a coat of shellac. So I imagine that you could probably still do this with the seal coat, which is the name of the brand, the D-Wax Shellac Sanding Sealer. As long as you're putting a coat over top of the wood, then you paint it it's easier to remove that paint because you've got that protective layer over the wood. So anyway, get yourself a, a, a can of the seal coat. It's by Zinzer. It's called Universal Sanding Sealer, 100% wax-free shellac, and I'll leave that down below. But it is great for using as a sealing coat, and you can actually sand it down too. All right, so the next lesson that I learned is that there's something called grain filler. Now, this isn't something I think most people will need to know, but it's just kind of interesting, right? I'd never even heard of grain filler until I started working on the vanity. But the idea is that there are porous woods that have to have their grain filled if you want them to be as smooth as glass. So like oak, for example, red oak, 
that stuff is very, very porous. Like if you took a telescope, not a telescope, a microscope, <laughs> if you take a microscope and you look real close at the grain of red oak, you just see all these little holes where the grain is. Like it's crazy to think of how porous that is. So when you want something that's smooth as butter, you can actually use, again, the sanding sealer to seal up very porous woods like the red oak. But some woodworkers actually like the look of finished wood with a rough, bumpy surface. And so they may not, you know, want to use that. That may be the look they're going for. But you can also use grain filler. And I found this to be very difficult to use. I actually bought some. It's by this brand called Balen, B-E-H-L-E-N. It's called Poropack grain filler reducer. And then there's the grain filler and I think you have to mix them together. It was kind of a mess. But if you are doing a project like Red Oak and you do want to create a nice smooth glassy surface, then you might want to get comfortable with figuring out how to use grain filler. I thought it was pretty difficult to use. I did try a sample of it on, you know, another piece of board when I was using the red oak to build my vanity. And I just found it to be very, very, very messy. But it's not impossible to work with. And I think if you're someone who's building something with red oak and you want it to be nice, smooth as glass, you have to use a pore filler. And I think the Poro Pack, P O R E dash O dash P A C, Poro Pack grain filler, is an option to use. And I, again, I didn't even know that this was an option, something that was even a product that you could buy. Now, if you do use a grain filler, you can mix it with something called universal tents. If you're using grain filler, you can mix it with different colors in order to highlight that grain. But what I found that worked really, really well is something called Brywax Liming Wax. Brywax is the brand name. Liming Wax was the product. And I found that this was like, oh my gosh, this was so much fun to work with to create this ceruced oak look. So if you are someone who wants to build a project and give it this beautiful finish, I would highly recommend you buy some of the Bry Wax, the Liming Wax. It is gorgeous. But what I found that works really well is when, I mean, I won't go through the entire thing. I do have a video on how I created some of this ceruced oak look, but if you take some of that liming wax and you fill the grain of that oak, and then you take a little bit of clear wax and go over it with the clear wax, it helps to get off the liming wax because liming wax is very thick. And I find that it's a little difficult to get off of your project. But if you go over it with the liming wax, filling in the grain, and then take a little bit of clear wax and go over it, that liming wax will settle into the grain and then all the wax that's left on the surface of the wood, it'll start to wipe off with the clear wax. So just a little tip. I'm telling you, go get some sample boards <laughs> of red oak. It looks beautiful. I'm telling you, I just, I love it. I love it. So lesson number six is I have learned to make something called glue size. All right. Have you ever stained a project and the edges were darker than the face of the wood? Now, if you've made projects and you've stained it, I can guarantee you this has happened to you. Now, I did a project several years ago where I sanded down and restained this $5 thrifted oak coffee table and the ends were much, much darker than the top. Well, the reason why is because the end of the wood is like a straw. So if you think about it, when you're putting any sort of wood dye or stain on a piece of wood and you put it on the end grain, it's like straws. It's sucking up that stain, that pigment, and it's going to look much darker on the edges. Well, here's the thing. If you make something called glue size, which is actually just a mixture of about 50% wood glue and 50% water, if you put that on the edge of the board, it'll actually prevent that wood from sucking up the stain or the dye so that the ends of the board will look just as evenly stained as the other side of the board, the face of the board. This is actually like mind blowing. I, I did this for my vanity because on the doors, right? So on the doors, I actually used a router and I used a router table to create this kind of like a decorative edge on the doors. And I knew that if I went over the edge of these doors with the die, it was going to look much darker on those edges. And you can see all this in the blog post. I know it's kind of hard to explain, but just imagine you've got a solid oak 
door, red oak, and you've just put some stain on there and it looks great or some dye, I should say dye, because that's what I used. But right along the decorative edges that I created with the router and the router bit, you've got it dark on the sides. I didn't want that to happen. So when I was building this vanity, all the cut edges of this solid red oak, I used glue size and let that dry. And then when you go over it with your wood dye or your stain, if you're using stain, it won't be too dark. And then use a brush or maybe one of those foam brushes and just, you know, go along the edge of your wood. If it's something that is going to be visible. Now, if you're doing something with plywood, that's a little different because most time you're using something called edge banding. And if you don't know what edge banding is, it's a little thin strip of veneer, has some glue on the back, and you can use an iron and you attach that to your wood edges. And that just finishes a, a project off and makes it look amazing. But if you're using solid red oak, like I was, and the edges are going to be beautiful and clean, you definitely want to make sure that you're using something like glue size that you just whip up in your shop, apply that, and then use your wood dye. Okay, moving on to lesson number seven, practice, practice, practice. When you are trying out a new dye, a new stain, a new technique for finishing wood, I say always practice on a thousand pieces of sample boards because when you have found a great thrifted piece of furniture, you know, sometimes you're not going to be able to practice on that. You know, it's kind of a one and done. So the the practice that you do on a piece of scrap wood may not look the exact same, but if you're building something, I would say buy a little bit of extra wood and use some of that extra wood to do sample boards. Everything that you are attempting to do, do it on your sample board. Now, I really think I would have wasted a lot of money if I had just gotten an idea and decided to just get started on my, my board. There were so many sample boards that I did that it was really starting to, to get expensive because I had so many sample boards and I'm like, wait a minute, I just spent how much money on all this wood and I keep putting all these different products. But once I found the look I was going for, then it was worth it. It was worth it. So definitely practice and never try something on your, your real project until you've had a chance to practice. And number eight, lesson number eight is just have fun with it. You know, someone reminded me that finishing wood doesn't have to be a frustrating process. And I'm going to remind you that finishing wood doesn't have to be frustrating. It can be fun because you're learning, you're experimenting, you're becoming kind of like a chemist. You know, maybe you're finding some color combinations of a couple of dyes or a couple of pigments that you really like. You don't know what kind of unique finish that you're going to get until you start mixing with this and do a little bit of layer with that. Just make it fun and creative and don't lose the fun aspect. And remember, you're still doing this on your practice boards. And once you figure it out, then you can do it on your real board. I would tell you to take good notes also. Make sure you're labeling all of these practice boards while you're having fun. Label these boards so that when you come back to it, you know exactly what you did. You could even maybe on the back attach a piece of paper to show what the process was. Because when I was trying to get that serose look for the wood, for the red oak, at one point I couldn't figure out what I did. <laughs> I was like, man, this piece looks amazing. But I couldn't remember what order I had put things. So you don't want that to happen. So as you're having fun and practicing and learning, just jot down some notes, what worked and what didn't work. All right, lesson number nine, do not be afraid to buy yourself a book. You know, as much info that's available online, it's sometimes hard to let go of your hard earned cash to buy books because you feel like everything is already online. Why would you have to buy a book? I actually like to go to the library and check out some books, but I also like to have my own little library of, of resources that I can always go back to. There is a book that I really, really like. It's called The New Wood Finishing Book. And it has so much information in it. I, I know I have it on my book, bookshelf somewhere. I have not looked at it recently, but it's by someone named Michael Dresner. And I think I actually reached out to him on a message board or maybe I emailed him or something. And I think he responded. <laughs> so that was pretty cool. But I will leave a link down below. Get a book, start building your library so that whenever things come up or questions come up, you can go to your favorite resources and see, okay, what did I learn in this book? What are the notes that I took in this book for the finishing that I want to do on this project? I actually, you know, now that I'm talking about this, I think I'm, I'm going to go find that book on my bookcase and I'm going to just start looking through it 
and reading through it. But anyway, moving on to the next lesson, lesson number 10, find a good woodworking store nearby. You know, I love Amazon so much. I do love Home Depot. I actually love Lowe's too, but there is nothing like a woodworking store when it comes to buying stains and other materials and wood because these people are knowledgeable. And a lot of times when you go into the big box stores, they don't know anything. <laughs> Sometimes I hate even like stopping to ask a question because in my mind, I'm like, I know you don't know what you're talking about. But these woodworking stores like Woodcraft, they have locations all over the U.S. There's one here in, in Maryland near where I live. It's in Rockville. I'm gonna give them a shout out. I know the owners. They're awesome. Amy and Chris, they're married. And then they're partners with the other guy named Ralph. So these three people are awesome. When I go in there, they know who I am. I've spent a ton of money on tools and products in there. But if you have a local woodcraft store, reach out to that store, go there because they typically know what they're talking about versus going to Home Depot or Lowe's. Those people generally don't know what products to recommend. They tend to be a little bit more expensive, but if you're getting some advice and you're supporting a local business, then yeah. And also, there's times when you want to do a project and you want to do it right now. You don't want to wait one or two days for shipping to come, you know, shoot Amazon. Sometimes it'll, it'll get you the product the same day. But at least at the woodworking store, you've got somebody there who's knowledgeable. And if I'm going to pay a little bit more, I'm willing to pay more if it means I've got somebody knowledgeable that can tell me about the products. And they have wood dyes. <laughs> I think that's where I bought them, like the wood dyes that I bought, the trans trans fast wood dyes. If you look on the blog post, there's some beautiful colors that I had not even imagined using. This kind of makes me excited looking at the picture now because there's so many colors that I hadn't even imagined <laughs> to use, like, you know, like a beautiful blue and red and uh, all these amazing colors. So anyway, look into wood dyes, go to your local woodcraft store, support them and see all the samples that they have for all the different products and buy some books. They got books there too. All right, so what's next for me? I'm gonna be doing a kitchen makeover. I think I told you in my last video for the 2021 goals, my goal is I'm going to be building some kitchen cabinets, but those are probably gonna be like maybe with MDF or maybe ply, probably plywood, and I'm gonna paint those. But I can tell you that if I build something with wood, I've learned so many more things over the years because of the projects that I've done that I feel like I kinda of got a handle on what I'm doing. <laughs> But there's always more to learn, right? And I'm always receptive to learning any tips. So if you've got some tips or products that you love, definitely shoot me an email, serena at thriftdiving.com. I actually had gotten an email from a reader some time ago, and she told me about some amazing products and can't even remember what they are off the top of my head, but she recommended them to me and I bought them <laughs> and I'll have to look it up. But the products were uh, products that if you didn't want to refinish something, like it, let's say it's something's in pretty good order, but it's got some scratches and just needs a little bit of elbow grease. These products are supposed to restore it without you having to strip it. And she highly recommended it. It was kind of expensive. It was like $50 for a small bottle. I didn't want to spend that kind of money, but she's like, trust me, you're going to appreciate these products. So I actually bought like one in three colors. Like, I mean, one in each of the colors. Anyway, if you've got a product or a tip, a woodworking tip or a finishing tip that you absolutely love, send it to me, Serena at Thrift Diving, and I'll be sure to include it in the blog post. I'll be sure to make sure that I'm telling people what I learn from you so that we can keep all of this knowledge going. All right, guys, that's what I got for you today. I hope you enjoy this. I hope you learned something. All the links down below for the products that I talked about, the blog post, everything that you need is down below in the show notes. Be sure to come back next week. Also, follow me on Instagram. If you're not following me, I can be found at Thrift Diving. I'm usually posting behind the scenes things of what I'm working on. Oh, and I will give you an update. The electrician was supposed to come this week, but there's been some mishaps. So he's going to come next Friday. But right now, I am 95% done the electrical wiring in my shed. Isn't that amazing? This project that I didn't think that I could do, 
oh my goodness, I feel like I need to pat myself on the back because <laughs> I understand what I'm doing and I'm getting it done. So the only thing that, that I need to do left is to strip the wires and then just make the little hooks. That's it. So for the rough-in inspection, that will happen after the electrician comes and connects everything to the sub-panel. I went to the store and spent like, gosh, 150 bucks maybe for all of the uh, PVC pipes for the conduit. I, I need internet in my shed. Right now, it's not a very strong signal from the house. So I bought all those materials so that the electrician can bury those in the ground for when Xfinity comes or Verizon. I don't know which one. I have Verizon, but I may change to Xfinity. We'll see. So yeah, things are moving along, but everything has to be exposed and stripped and create those little hooks before the inspector comes. So I am ready. I am so ready for electricity. And then after the electricity is in, I am going to do the insulation and then I have to do the drywall and then the inspector has to come back and make sure that you know, all the receptacles are working and everything's good to go. So it is coming. Oh, and then the floor. <laughs> Got to do the floor. So it's coming along, guys. The shed is looking amazing. And I just am so thankful that I'm finally going to have a place to work. All right. So that's what I got for you. Be sure to come back next week for episode 45. I'm not sure what I'm going to be talking about, but we're going to talk about something cool. <laughs> all right. I'll see you next episode. <laughs>